All right, people found it very annoying last time, so let me just get this out of the way right now. Anti-morphing ray? Jesus! <laughs> Who came up with that? Being the Merciless? Is that kind of on-the-nose naming you expect from an Ed Wood film? <laughs> ah, okay, with that out of my system, let's get on with the torture. <laughs> It's tough being the Animorphs guy on YouTube because whenever you want to talk about anything else, everyone just ignores it and keeps trying to bring the conversation back to Animorphs. Yes, I'm talking to you. But I guess I kind of get it this time. Number 33, The Illusion, is a pretty big deal. It's widely considered to be one of the greats by fans, and there was plenty to get excited about when the book originally came out. Tobias morphing into an Andalite? W was he morphing Axe? Or had he somehow unlocked his Andalite heritage? It's the first one. That would be pretty much the last bit of perspective we need to get a complete picture of the most popular alien race the series ever produced. We've already had books narrated by Andalites, and we've had Andalites and human physiology and culture compared from an Andalite point of view, but now we finally get that comparison from the human point of view. Add to that a rare moment of direct continuity. The anti-morphing race seemed like a stock MacGuffin in the last book, and it was unusual for that conflict to still be unresolved at the end. This book picks up immediately afterwards, with us finally getting to see just what kind of threat this device is. And this is just the excitement we can derive from the front and back covers. Behind the scenes, this marks the first book by ghost writer Ellen Giroux, who holds a number of distinctions for the series. First, she wrote the most books out of all the ghost writers, five in total. And not puffy filler books about Atlantis or getting possessed by a ghost or whatever, but five very heavy and serious books. Second, she's arguably the most talented of all the ghost writers, and I hope to demonstrate that in this review. In a poll I did on Richard's Animorphs forum for favorite ghost writer, Ellen won by a very decent margin. So it's kind of sad that I can't find out anything about her. She had no other books credited to her, no hint of possible other pen names, no one going by that name in the publishing world. She's pretty much the ghost of ghost writers. I even asked Michael Grant about her over Twitter, and all he said was, very smart, was our helper after Jake was born, ran our charity for a while, good ghostwriter, lost track of her. This feels so unsatisfying. You could strongly argue that Ellen Giroux is the fourth most important person in the creation of Animorphs, behind Catherine Applegate, Michael Grant, and Scholastics editor Tanya Alicia Martin. You ever see that documentary called Stone Reader, where a guy tries to hunt down an incredibly obscure author? I think I might have to make a Stone Reader 2 electric boogaloo. The book opens with a school dance. This time the Animorphs have the good sense to not bring axe. Tobias is having a pretty rotten time, spending what at this point has to be close to two years in the body of a hawk, tends to leave you out of touch with basic human etiquette. He even loses track of what he's writing, starting with the typical my name is intro, but ends up on a tangent for a bit before starting the intro over again. Tobias is getting worried and frustrated. He has 20 minutes left in Human Morph, and Rachel is being pretty difficult. Listen, Rachel, I have to get going, and... I added more quietly. Time's running out. What do you mean? You have a full... Well, at least 15 minutes left. You're saying you'd rather be sitting up in your tree watching owls eat nocturnal rodents than be with me? She asked. Her tone was somewhere between challenging and coy. Dangerous in either direction. Now we saw in number 23, The Pretender, that using bathroom breaks as an excuse to just demorph and remorph isn't that big of a deal. You might be a bit more exhausted at the end of the day, but it's still possible. The two-hour limit excuse is just that, an excuse. 
Tobias was never the most socially comfortable kid before coming an Animorph, and spending such long, isolated stretches of time in the body of a wild animal has done him no favors in that regard. He's only really here for Rachel, and she isn't helping matters with her attitude. Eventually, a Goo Goo Dolls song scares him off, and he runs to the hulls to find a safe place to demorph. Now, the question is, was Rachel intentionally trying to t trick Tobias into getting stuck in human form? Wait a second. Hey! She called angrily. I slowed and finally stopped, in front of a bulletin board display. On birds of prey, of all things. Tacked to the cork was an image of a bald eagle. Wings spread wide, soaring in the deep blue sky. And a northern harrier on a fence post, silhouetted against the clouds. Tobias, I want to explain. She broke off as her eyes followed mine to the picture of the red-tailed hawk and the caption beneath it. Longevity in the wild, it read, almost never reaches the figures obtained by captive birds guarded against disease and predation. A generous estimate? Eighteen years. Rachel stared at the wall and looked at the floor. In an instant, the bulletin board display had thrown our friendship into the harsh light of reality. Rachel was a girl who could, on occasion, become a bird of prey. I was a hawk who could, on occasion, become human. Rachel has suggested Tobias stay as a human before, most notably in Megamorphs 2, but naturally that would come at the price of Tobias no longer having any real function as part of the team. He'd have to sit the rest of the war out in the Chi hideout or something. In a practical sense, there are plenty of get-arounds for the Hawk's average lifespan. First, considering the healing capabilities of morphing, Tobias is probably the healthiest Hawk in existence, and could probably beat that average lifespan by maybe even a dozen years. And only then, when it becomes clear that his hawk body isn't holding up anymore, does he become a human nothlet. Though, considering the age of his human morph, that would make him roughly a 45-year-old man in the body of a 13-year-old boy, which could be a blessing or a curse, depending on your point of view. Of course, this assumes that the war, or, I don't know, ramming into a spaceship for shits and giggles doesn't kill him first. But this situation isn't about the practical sense. Nothing about human emotions can be described as practical. All Rachel can see about Tobias' situation is the negatives, both in the biological sense, with the hawk shorter lifespan, and in a personal sense, Tobias' inability to socialize with other people, and specifically her. Do I think she intentionally set things up to get Tobias stuck as a human? Actually, yes. Especially if we go with the theory that the traumatic events of the last book resulted in a Rachel that's more impulsive and short-sighted. In many ways, this is a parallel with Tobias' original choice to get stuck as a hawk. A drastic action made by immediate emotional impulses, and not really thought out that much. She paused to consider her next words. She was embarrassed by what she was about to say, fighting to get past her embarrassment. But you've got to realize that there's more. I'm not just a warrior, she said, her blue eyes glittering so close to mine. I'm a girl. I'm trying not to let myself get dragged off the cliff, away from all normalcy, into this insane life we live. I don't like what it does to me, Tobias, and I need to be a girl again. I need a little bit of normalcy, okay? Not a lot, but... Some. Tobias leaves her and tries to find a spot to demorph, but keeps getting interrupted, once by an old teacher that recognizes him and tries to stop him because, you know, his face was on milk cartons there for a while, and another by Chapman confronting Eric King over smoking a cigarette. The scene has nothing to do with anything, but it's still interesting to see a millennium-old robot pretending to be a teenage boy and a brain-infesting alien slug pretending to be a high school vice principal play off each other. Naturally, e-cigarettes are a thousand times more addictive to chi than regular ones. Tobias finds a place to demorph in the nick of time, but before he leaves, he has a quick chat with Jake. Turns out Eric is there to report that the chi have lost track of the AMR, so the Animorphs are going to have to have a meeting the next morning. It felt good to hear Jake say I was indispensable, but... With Jake, he could never be sure anymore what was sincere and what was just, you know, expedient. He'd been the most open of guys back in the old days. What you saw with Jake was what you got. But he's been a leader for a long time now. He'd learned to say what he needed to say. 
Jake needed me as one of the Animorphs. He liked me, respected me, was happy for me when I was happy, and when he had to, he used me without regard for anything but winning. If there's one thing that Ellen Giroux focuses the most on in her books, it's how these characters feel about each other through these interactions. Even in such a small scene where Jake just gives a small info dump and compliments Tobias, we have to put the relationship between these two characters front and center. The next morning, the Animorphs discuss their options. They know that the AMR is complete enough for testing, but Visor 3 isn't up for volunteering since it might be lethal. Since this means the Yerks will be laying down traps, Jake suggests that they intentionally get captured and brought to the AMR, giving them a window to destroy it. Nobody wants to say it, but everyone realizes that Tobias is the logical one among the group to get captured. The reason being that the Yerks will think Tobias is an Andalite in Hawkmorph. Even if the rest of the Animorphs don't get there in time, the AMR wouldn't work on him since he's not morphed, and the Yerks would have to scrap the project. Nobody's too happy with this idea, but Jake makes the call. Even though it could mean Tobias' death, his capture is the only sure way to eliminate this threat. To make the deception even more convincing, Axe agrees to allow Tobias to acquire and morph him, allowing the Yerks to see an Andalite turn into a hawk. Tobias finds the idea rather exhilarating. This leads to everyone's favorite chapter, the one where Tobias morphs Andalite, and we learn a shit ton about their culture. Yeah, this is pretty much an Animorph's wet dream. In one short chapter, it contributes so much to our idea of an Andalite, as does the entirety of the Andalite Chronicles or any of the Axe narrated books. There is just so much information packed in there, but it's presented so organically that it never comes off as an info dump. The conversations between Tobias and Axe never feel unnatural. I won't go over everything here, there's just way too much in this, but I will highlight a key point. My tale. Unexpected, yet an extension so natural I'd almost failed to notice how I carried it, erect and steadied about at shoulder level. The blade edge glistened in the sun's final rays. I was equipped for this world. For any world, really. A natural weapon. In the hork Chronicles, we learn that the Andalites retained a protective instinct from millions of years ago, before they evolved tail blades and were simply pack animals that were preyed upon. How any creature might have evolved a tail blade is a long and probably fruitless thought experiment, but when you combine this information with the following... And then I recognize the Andalite mind. Yes, it was all the things I imagined it would be. Confident, alert, poised for combat... But there was another element that took me off guard. Something bubbling happily away beneath the rationality. Nothing giddy like a dolphin's playfulness. Something less simple. Optimism. That was it. Intense optimism. Man, I had no idea! I turned my head towards Axe. His eyes were smiling the way they do. Keep in mind that you are experiencing instinct. The Andalite mind in its untrained state. Our culture teaches us to temper and control our optimism, to give equal value to realism. We have become, regrettably, a race of warriors. But that is in response to necessity. Deep down, beneath that, I believe we are a peaceful species, in love with learning, not combat. But to learn, and to fight, you must be joyful. Consider that the Andalites are herbivores. They couldn't be carnivores if they tried. That puts them in a position that, at least in terms of Earth, is pretty unique. A herbivore species that is the dominant race of their ecosystem, aka on top of the food chain. Typically that role is given to dangerous meat-eating species, as they are the ones most equipped to protect themselves. This causes the Andalites to have an instinctual conflict of interests, one part of them still being skittish pack animals, and the other part an overriding sense that you're safe. You can do things with your life besides keeping predators at bay. Of course, that kind of parallels human development, kinda, but even humans are omnivores, and a lot of their development had to do with how we consumed and utilized other animals. I, I don't know, maybe the Elemist fucked optimism into them. <laughs>